Hi everyone, so today we're going to talk about how to pick the best resonance structures if you have a set of non-equivalent resonance structures. So we talked about this idea of non-equivalent resonance structures in prior videos, and these structures uh, are not the same as each other because they have different formal charges. Just as an example, bromate ion is uh, the one that we looked at before, and we noticed that uh, in that case the formal charge of the bromine atom in this case changes as you draw the various resonance structure. So we know that these are what we call non-equivalent resonance structures. Now when we have these type of resonance structures, usually one of the resonance structure is more likely to be observed in experimental um, measurements compared to other resonance structures. So our goal today is to figure out, um, let's say given four of these non-equivalent resonance structures, which one is closest to the experimental structure. And I'm going to use this term best uh, to refer to that structure, the experimentally observed structure. So just keep that in mind. Um, these are the rules that you want to use when you try to pick these best structure or best resonance structure. The first one is you want your formal charge to be as close to zero as possible for all the atoms. The reason for this is because, generally speaking, atoms don't really have charges uh, when they're bonded. If they have charges, then they're not as stable and they need to uh, interact with atoms of opposite charges in order to stabilize themselves. So it's best to have um, a model of the structure that has formal charges uh, close to zero as possible. So either zero, or minus one or plus one, but you know, if you get minus two or plus two, then it's not as good. And that really is the rule, the second rule there. You want formal charges that are fairly small if you have to have one. And then the third is if you have negative formal charges, they should be placed on the more electronegative atom. So you don't want, for example, a less electronegative atom to have a negative formal charge whereas a more electronegative atom not to have any formal charge. That would not make sense physically, right? So let's go back to these bromate resonance structures and think about how to use the rules that we just discussed to pick the best resonance structures, okay? So immediately with rule number one, what I'm looking at here is four different resonance structures. And I've already calculated the formal charge for all of these resonance structures uh, for all the atoms in them. And I'm trying to just figure out which one gives me formal charges distribution. They're as close to zero as possible for each of the atom. And if you look, clearly the first one is not that great because all the atoms have formal charges. The second one is better because one of the oxygen now has a formal charge of zero. And then the third one is even better because now two of those oxygen atoms, actually three atoms, I should say, have formal charges of zero. And then only one oxygen has a charge of minus one. And then the fourth one, if you look at it, also has three atoms, in this case oxygen, having zero formal charges, and then the bromine has a negative one formal charge. Okay, so, so far, based on rule number one, I can uh, remove these two resonance structures from consideration uh, for being the best structure. I'm really just left with these two because both of them have zero formal charges on three atoms and only one negative formal charge on one of the atoms, except that the atoms are different. In one case, it's on oxygen. In the other case, it's on bromine. So if you think about the second rule, the second rule says it's better to have smaller formal charges compared to larger formal charges. That really doesn't play a role, doesn't help us in this case in distinguishing these two structures because they have exactly the same type of t distribution of formal charges, 0, 0, 0, and minus 1, except that the only difference is on different atoms. So that second rule in this case doesn't really help us distinguish which one is better. The third rule, if we look at it again, says that you want your negative formal charge to be on the more electronegative atom. Now that rule might help us in this case because our negative charge is on different atoms. So then the a way we were going to use it is we're going to look at is bromine or oxygen more electronegative? Which one is more electronegative? And of course if you look at the electronegative negativity chart, you'll find that oxygen is the more electronegative atom. And so as a result, in this particular case, I would pick C as my best resonance structure. Keep in mind though that 
D is not a bad structure necessarily. It might not be as good as C, but uh, as we said before, resonance structures are just theoretical models for the actual experimental structure. So the experimental structure might be a hybrid uh, or a weighted average of these two resonance structures. So perhaps 70% of the experimental structure has this feature, whereas 30% of it has this feature. Okay. Let's do a second example now, which is the SCN minus ion. So uh, at this point, you should go ahead and challenge yourself and try to draw the different non-equivalent resonance structures that's possible for SCN minus. Okay, so I was uh, here are the three structures that I draw, and I hope you that you have the same three structures uh, as a result of you drawing those non-equivalent resonance structures. Remember that you want to have satisfied the octet rule in this case for these elements um, for C and N, so make sure you have that. These are the three different non-equivalent resonance structures. And I know they're non-equivalent even before calculating formal charges because I see that the bonding pattern is different between the S and the C and the N in this case for the three different structures. Now I can go ahead and calculate the formal charge and you should try that on your own. And these are the formal charges, okay? Now once I have these formal charges, then again, I can use the rules that I talked about earlier to determine which one might be the best structure I have in this case. So it's pretty clear to me that B can be removed here because it has two atoms having charges, whereas in C and in A, only one of the atoms has a formal charge. So again, that's rule number one where we want everything to have zeros if possible. Then we compare A and C now. In A and C, basically the difference is that the negative one is either on nitrogen or on sulfur. Now, again, you would go back to that rule number three that says if you have a negative charge, you want it to be on the more electronegative atom. In this case, we'll look up the electronegativity charge. We see that nitrogen is more electronegative than sulfur, so we would prefer this structure to that structure, okay? And again, it's not gonna be a huge, um, you know, it's not, doesn't mean necessarily that this is 100% of the experimental structure. It might be, again, 70% looking like this and 30% uh, looking like that. And what I mean by that is then, you know, you have to average out these two structures uh, as a weighted average. And weighted average is a concept we discuss when we talk about, you know, isotopic uh, abundance uh, way back in topic two. So the same idea, you would sort of figure out that there's a double bond here, there's a single bond here, so the actual bond might be somewhere between single and double, but since this one is the better structure, it might be closer to a double bond than it is to a single bond, okay?